Hello and welcome. Uh, welcome to um, all of our attendees who are uh, joining us for this uh, round of the Marxist classes. We're joined today by Carlos Martinez um, to talk about his new book, The East is Still Red, uh, Chinese Socialism in the 21st Century. Carlos is the author of another book, uh, The End of the Beginning. Um, and off the top of my head, I don't remember the subtitle of that one. Carlos, could you help me out there? Uh, lessons from the Soviet Collapse, maybe? Lessons from the Soviet Collapse. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, once again, uh, for those who are just joining in, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we've got a, a good program today. We'll have a presentation of, uh, of the book and then uh, some time for Q&A at the end. Once again, uh, our guest today is Carlos Martinez. Um, he's an independent uh, political activist and researcher from London, Britain. Uh, he's the author of The East is Still Red, Chinese Socialism in the 21st Century. Uh, that's this year, 2023. And The End of the Beginning, Lessons of the Soviet Collapse, uh, published in 2019. His main area of research is the construction of socialist societies, past and present. He's co-editor of Friends of Socialist China and co-founder of No Cold War. Um, and this is, uh, it's certainly a pleasure uh, to have Carlos uh, with us today, um, especially since the uh, U.S. ruling class is heightening its um, uh, imperialist aggression and its um, assault both on uh, China and on anyone who speaks out against U.S. foreign policy and uh, U.S. imperialism. Um, we're going to get started here in just a moment. Um, uh, and I think with uh, that said, I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to Carlos. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction, Scott. I am going to try and share my screen so that you've got some slides. Um, give me a shout if there's anything wrong with this. Okie dokie. Right. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for attending today. Thank you for inviting me to introduce my book, The East is Still Red, Chinese Socialism in the 21st Century. If I may, I'd like to just quickly start by briefly paying tribute to the Canadian communist Isabel Crook who sadly passed away this morning in Beijing at the age of 107. She was born in Sichuan in 1915, the daughter of Canadian missionaries, and she was a lifelong supporter of and participant in the Chinese Revolution. Um, the investigation that she and her husband David wrote about land reform in the liberated territories in the 1940s, called Ten Mile In, remains one of the classics of English language reporting on Chinese socialism. And, you know, all, all foreign friends of China owe her a great deal, including uh, uh, the responsibility to take her work forward. So, on to the book. I had two central motivations in writing this book. Firstly, I wanted to help mobilise people against an escalating new Cold War, which I consider to be an extremely dangerous phenomenon. Second, I wanted to contribute to a Marxist understanding of contemporary China, and, and particularly to engage with and answer those on the left who consider China to be a capitalist or even an imperialist country. So what I'd like to focus on today is the latter of those issues, understanding the class character of China, because there's a huge amount of confusion on this topic. Um, and it's obviously relevant to the work of our movement in general and to your organization in particular. Uh, you know, a lot of people consider China to be a capitalist country. It's easy enough to understand why right-wingers believe this. China is obviously a pretty major success story. It's gone from being one of the poorest countries in the world to being the second largest economy in the world in dollar D uh, GDP terms, the largest in purchasing power parity terms. Its life expectancy used to be several years below the global average, now it's several years above the global average and has indeed surpassed that of the US. China's gone from a state of extreme technological backwardness to being a science and technology powerhouse. So sure, right-wingers would prefer to attribute all of this to capitalism rather than socialism. Why not? To fit China's rise into their worldview, they say that, well, China dropped all this socialism nonsense after the aberration that was the Mao Zedong period, 
took up capitalism and prospered thereafter. And in these days of new Cold War, the right wing narrative has expanded a little bit to include the idea of China's rise being the result of theft, plagiarism, spy balloons, and, you know, the world domination schemes of these cynical Fu Manchu type characters that run the Communist Party of China, and so on. Marxists, of course, have no particular interest in attributing China's successes to capitalism, but many of them still struggle to see how it can be considered socialist. After all, there are quite a lot of things about China that don't sit particularly well with our vision of what socialism is supposed to look like. For example, there's private capital in China, there's the exploitation of labor in China, there's huge inequality, there's engagement with the capitalist global economy. Um, you can walk in the center of Beijing or Shanghai or Guangzhou and you'll see branches of Starbucks, you'll see McDonald's, KFC, Nike, and so on. These enormous multinational brands have penetrated China and many on the left feel uncomfortable about that. Maybe some people even remember the first McDonald's opening in Moscow connected with Gorbachev's so-called perestroika reforms. That was in 1990, and all of a sudden in 1991, the Soviet Union stopped existing. And looking back, we can obviously see a, a causal relationship, not specifically with McDonald's, but with the whole political trajectory of perestroika. China's got nearly 500 billionaires, second only to the US, which has 735. Of course, China's a huge country, and proportionally speaking, so measured proportional to the population, China's actually below the global average in terms of its number of billionaires. Uh, and interestingly, by the way, that number is has been on a downward trend over the last few years, unlike elsewhere in the world. But anyway, China's got billionaires. There certainly weren't any billionaires in the Soviet Union. There weren't any billionaires in the German Democratic Republic. Um, and indeed, China's market reforms have gone way further than Soviet market reforms ever did. So there are quite a few things about China that don't feel terribly socialist or that perhaps don't fit very comfortably with what our notion of what socialism is or our vision of what we ourselves as communists are fighting for, are struggling for. Um, so there's a great deal of confusion. And in my view, that confusion is understandable and it needs to be seriously addressed. Um, now, if there are some things that don't feel terribly socialist, there are also some things that don't feel terribly capitalist. Uh, especially in relation to poverty alleviation, especially in relation to living conditions. The bottom line is that living standards have increased consistently and dramatically throughout the period of existence of the People's Republic of China. Life expectancy in 1949, at the time of the founding of the People's Republic, was around 35. Less than 10% of the population was literate. 90% of the population was situated in the countryside, the majority as tenant farmers and agricultural laborers suffering grinding poverty in a thousands of year old feudal system. Women faced unspeakable levels of oppression. The vast majority of people lacked access to healthcare, electricity, gas, or running water. Millions died every year due to malnutrition. So, if we consider People's China both before 1978, what's generally referred to as the Mao period, and after 1978, the reform and opening up period, both have been phenomenally successful in terms of improving living conditions. By the time of Mao, Mao Zedong's death in 1976, life expectancy had reached around 67. So that means that in the space of 27 years, from 1949 to 1976, average life expectancy had increased by 32 years, like almost doubling. That's historically completely unprecedented. Illiteracy had been largely eliminated. Feudalism was comprehensively defeated. And the most extensive land reform program in history was enacted. The social position of women improved beyond recognition. Basic healthcare and education were made available throughout the country for the first time. And the population level actually doubled in that period between 49 and 76. So you know, while there are all those particularly right-wingers who want to claim that the Mao period was a terrible failure and a disaster for the Chinese people, etc., reality doesn't actually bear that out. There were, of course, problems. There were, of course, contradictions and excesses, particularly, uh, particularly in relation to the Great Leap Forward, particularly in relation to the Cultural Revolution. But it's indisputable 
that um, um, the Chinese people experienced a dramatic and unprecedented improvement in their living conditions during the first three decades of socialist construction. And I'm just looking at the chat. Scott has asked if he can interrupt me. Scott, you're very welcome to interrupt me. Yes, uh, thank you, Carlos. I apologize for the interruption. I wanted to tell our uh, participants, um, if you have questions that you'd like to submit for the Q&A, uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. There will be a, a little icon with Q&A under it. Click on that and uh, please put your question in there and I will uh, um, pass them on to uh, Carlos in the question and answer period. Um, thank you very much for that. And I apologize again for the interruption, Carlos. No problem whatsoever. So um, that was the period up to 76, but conditions of life have also improved continuously in the reform period from 1978, when China is alleged to have gone capitalist. Chinese people live an awful lot better now than they did 45 years ago. And that's their lived reality, regardless of whether it fits with people's particular understanding of what socialism looks like. China now has a middle income population of around 500 million people. These are people who own their own homes, who have some disposable income, who are able to travel and so on. Even poor people in China have a roof over their heads. They may not have much in the way of disposable income, but their children get a minimum of nine years free education. They have access to healthcare, even if it's relatively basic. You know, if they get sick, they get treatment. If they need to see a doctor, they see a doctor. They're not in debt bondage, which, you know, uh, is if you consider their counterparts in most of the rest of Asia, is a very important thing. Um, they don't live in peri-urban slums. They've got access to modern energy. The vast majority have, you know, a refrigerator and the basic amenities of modern life. They've got water piped into their homes. They're entitled to a pension, which is pretty small, but is moving in the right direction. And these things are guarantees. When China launched its targeted campaign to fully eliminate extreme poverty, it defined extreme poverty not just on the basis of an income threshold, though the definition does include an income threshold, but also as meeting a set of criteria, including reliable access to adequate food and clothing, guaranteed access to medical services and safe housing with drinking water and electricity, and at least nine years of free education. So when we talk about China's rural poor living a relatively dignified life, we're not only talking of the average, we're actually talking about all of them. Like they might be considered as poor, but it's a very different category of poverty to that which can be seen elsewhere in Asia or Africa or Latin America or the Middle East or the Caribbean or the Pacific. The United Nations Development Program describes China as having carried out the most rapid decline in absolute poverty ever witnessed. Why China? Um, why has the most rapid decline in absolute poverty happened in China and not in India or in Indonesia or indeed in the US or Canada? Clearly, the answer to that question lies in its system of political economy. The capitalist system cannot attend to the needs of the masses like that. The capitalist class simply wouldn't allow resources to be directed so consistently towards solving the problems of ordinary people. That's not a matter of capitalists being bad people. It's because of the, the, the very nature of capital, as you know, is to expand at all costs. In as much as working people have any support in capitalist societies, which, well, you people are in the US and you don't get much support. We get a little bit more here in Britain, but it's gradually being taken away from us. It's because the working class has fought for that over the course of decades and centuries. And because the capitalist class lives in constant fear of socialism. But these are concessions, they can be taken away, and they never constitute a priority or a long term strategy of capitalist governance. The US is one of the richest countries in the world. And yet, there are 10s of millions of people there that lack access to healthcare, around half a million are homeless. And furthermore, the US's wealth relies to a considerable degree on spreading poverty, war and destruction in the global south. So wealth under capitalism, always has its counterpart in poverty. And, and on that basis, we, we should just say eliminating poverty is very much a socialist thing. You know, if capitalism could solve the problem of poverty, if capitalism could end homelessness, if it could ensure that everybody had enough food to eat, if it could ensure that everyone had access to, you know, a decent quality health, healthcare and education, then frankly, those of us on the left might have to revisit our worldview. Well, 
don't worry, comrades. Um, before you tear up your party cards, I'd urge you to consider another possible reason that China succeeded to such a degree in tackling poverty, and it's that it's a socialist country where political power lies ultimately in the hands of the working people. Uh, there are some other areas where China is making incredible progress and accomplish accomplishing remarkable things. In recent years, China's emerged as the undisputed global leader in renewable energy, biodiversity protection, and green transport systems. Why isn't it Britain that's done that? Why isn't the US leading the way when it comes to preventing climate breakdown or the European Union? The, the world has known about the problem for long enough. It was at the Rio summit in 1992 that the countries of the world agreed to coordinate on meaningful and systematic action to address climate change. How much better have things got since then? The answer, frankly, is not at all. The problem is actually much worse than it was because we've continued emitting greenhouse gases at a shocking rate. The US is still emitting carbon dioxide at about the same rate as it was in 1992. And that's in spite of exporting the bulk of its industry to the developing world, not least China. So we've left the problem to the market. We've absorbed this neoliberal wisdom that the profit motive and the dynamic between supply and demand will have a magical effect and all problems will be solved. And here we are three decades later and the proxy war in Ukraine has Western Europe reopening coal mines and US fracking companies making an absolute killing. The Biden government in the US and the Sunak government in Britain are issuing new drilling licenses left, right and center. You know, Christmas has come early for fossil fuel capitalism. So what about China? China accounted for 55% of all renewable energy investment last year. It has more installed renewable energy capacity than the G7 countries combined. Its solar capacity is now greater than that of the rest of the world combined. Coal has gone from 80% of its power mix two decades ago to around 50% now, and it continues its fast decline. Around 99% of the world's electric, uh, electric buses are made in China. Shenzhen in, in Guangdong is the first city in the world to have a fleet of 100% electric buses. Around 70% of the world's high-speed rail can be found in China, which compares quite favorably with the 0% that can be found in the United States. Forest coverage has doubled from 12% in 1980 to 24% today, uh, the result of the biggest forestation project the world has ever seen. China's announced its commitments to peak carbon emissions by 2030 and reach zero carbon by 2060. And these targets are, you know, they're not just figures, they're not just slogans, they're actively informing policy and planning at every level. And just as with China's successes in poverty alleviation, all this wouldn't be possible if China were a capitalist country, if the capitalist class were the ruling class in China. Precisely because the major levers of the economy are in the hands of the government, it's possible for China to actively reorient its economy towards a sustainable future. In line with Xi Jinping's comment that, we must strike a balance between economic growth and environmental protection. We will be more conscientious in promoting green, circular, and low carbon development. We will never again seek economic growth at the cost of the environment. We could also talk about different countries' responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. China went all out to protect human life. If China had pursued a similar policy to the US or Britain, it would have been expected to have suffered upwards of 5 million deaths. Again, this comes down to the structure of the Chinese economy and the location of political power in the working people. And for socialists to want to deny these achievements or to attribute them to capitalism, frankly, does not make a great deal of sense. So what is the Chinese economy all about? The CPC has always been very clear about what it's doing. It uses market forces within the overall context of a planned and state-run economy to stimulate the development of the productive forces. They consider that the development of the productive forces is the principal task of the primary stage of socialism. So in the, in the late 1970s, the Chinese leadership recognized that 30 years after the victory of the revolution, 30 years after the founding of, founding of New China, the country was still a very long way behind the advanced capitalist countries in terms of science and technology and in terms of living standards. Yes, they'd ended feudalism. They'd collectivized the land. 
they'd made progress in industrial development, and they'd established a comprehensive social welfare system. But China was still a poor country. And although the masses in the countryside weren't starving, nor were they living well. So the CPC developed a strategy to attract foreign capital, to learn from foreign technology, to move forward the process of industrialization, to move forward the process of modernization, to create jobs, to create wealth. And you know you have to say they've been phenomenally successful in all of that. And they've done so while continuing to maintain overall state control of the economy. The government maintains a very tight control over what they call the commanding heights, heavy industry, energy, transport, communications, and foreign trade. The financial system is dominated by the state-owned banks. So that means that the allocation of financial resources is largely in the hands of the state, which is primarily accountable not to private shareholders, but to the people. And that's precisely why China has so quickly become the world leader in renewable energy, for example, or, or why you can go to the poorest parts of Western or Central China and find world-class infrastructure. You know, in, in Britain, the government and media have been talking about leveling up for decades um, in terms of improving the situation in the north of the country and in Wales and elsewhere, um, and balancing the economic situation out with, with London. And I'm sure the same is the case with, with areas of the United States, but nothing ever happens because it isn't deemed profitable. China's where level, leveling up actually happens because the economy is directed towards the benefit of society. You've got plenty of private capital in China, but it exists at the grace of the state. It exists to the extent that it serves the overall interests of the people. A large part of the economy is in private hands, but is subjected to stringent regulation. And as such, you know, the whole system is a very long way from the neoliberal consensus that prevails in the West. The economy continues to be directed at the top level on the basis of five-year plans. China's land isn't privatized. It's owned and it's managed at the village level. So China's got a mixed economy. It's very different to what existed in the Soviet Union. It's very different to what existed in the European people's democracies. And indeed, it's very different to what exists today in Cuba or the DPRK, although it has to be said it's very similar to what exists in Vietnam. It's experimental, and to some degree, it's also dangerous. You know, the existence of foreign capital, the insertion into global value chains, the existence of very wealthy people with an interest in, in maintaining and expanding their wealth, all of these things introduce contradictions, all of them introduce problems, threats, dangers. But what socialist experiment in history hasn't faced contradictions, problems, threats, and dangers? As long as we live in a world that continues to be dominated by imperialism, building socialism will always be extremely difficult. That was the case with those socialist countries that sadly no longer exist. And it remains true today, you know, in China, in Venezuela, in Cuba, in Korea, in Vietnam, in Laos, in Nicaragua. What we can say is that 45 years after the initiation of reform and opening up, the People's Republic of China still exists, is still developing, is still meeting the needs of its people, and is still playing a profoundly positive role in global affairs. Its flag stays red. And, you know, given our own somewhat meager achievements on the road to socialism ourselves, we should probably have the humility to learn from China. Uh, Fidel Castro was particularly clear on this topic. Um, he said in 1993, if you want to talk about socialism, you mustn't forget what socialism has done in China. Once it was a country of hunger, poverty, disasters. Today, there's none of that. Today, China feeds, clothes, cares for, and educates 1.2 billion people. I think China is a socialist country, and Vietnam is a socialist country as well. And they insist they've introduced all the necessary reforms precisely to stimulate development and to continue advancing towards the objectives of socialism. In Cuba, for example, we've got many forms of private property. We've got tens of thousands of landowners who own, in some cases, up to 45 hectares. Practically all Cubans own their own homes. And what's more, we're more than open to foreign investment. But none of this detracts from Cuba's socialist character. And you know, broadly speaking, my position is, if it's good enough for Fidel, it's probably good enough for us. So I've alluded to this already, but I think it bears repeating. China has capitalists, but they don't constitute the ruling class. 
They don't call the shots. They don't dominate the machinery of the state. They don't control the government. Indeed, they're not even allowed to organize as a class. They're not allowed to form a political party to represent their class interests as people that own and deploy capital. And I often like to quote the Chinese political analyst, Eric Lee on this. He's interviewed uh, in John Pilger's documentary, The Coming War on China. And John Pilger asks, well, you know, you've got all this private capital, you've got these markets, you've got this polarization of wealth in China. Um, isn't it just capitalist? And Eric Lee responds, look, in China, you've got a vibrant market economy, but capital doesn't rise above political authority. Capital doesn't have enshrined rights. In America, the interests of capital and capital itself have risen above the American nation. Political authority cannot check the power of capital. And that's why America is a capitalist country, but China's not. Xi Jinping is certainly clear as to the class structure of Chinese society. The working class is China's leading class. It represents China's advanced productive forces and relations of production. It is our party's most steadfast and reliable class foundation. And it's the main force for upholding and building socialism with Chinese characteristics. As I said, political power in China is consolidated in the working class and its allies. Capitalists can join the CPC these days, but only if they accept and work towards its program. The country continues to be governed in the interests of ordinary people. And that class orientation is reflected in the government's uh, priorities and also its popularity, like even studies carried out by Western acad academic institutions, such as the Kennedy School at Harvard, routinely show that China's government has an approval rating comfortably above 90%. The leading political party in the country is a communist party, an organization that takes Marxism extremely seriously. Marxism is the default worldview in China. Yes, it's actually a very pluralistic society, contrary to all the stereotypes, but all school students learn the basics of Marxism. All the major universities have schools of Marxism. Understanding proletarian history, developing proletarian ideology is a flourishing field. It's certainly not like Britain, where Marxists and communists have to hide their beliefs in order to get a job or to keep their jobs. The Chinese leadership certainly continues to conceive of China's journey in terms of socialism and communism. And Xi Jinping often says, only socialism can save China. And socialism with Chinese characteristics is socialism and not any other kind of ism. The foundational scientific principles of socialism cannot be abandoned. Only if they are abandoned would our system no longer be socialist. So to me, at least, it would seem like a very strange conspiracy indeed for all of this to be some kind of elaborate political theater. In the view of Chinese Marxists, the key determining characteristic of socialism isn't the existence of markets or of private capital, but the consolidation of political power in the working class and its allies and society's overall trajectory towards communism. Deng Xiaoping put it very uh, concisely. If markets serve socialism, they are socialist. If they serve capitalism, they are capitalist. And the last thing I'd like to mention is that China's development model is, is actually changing, you know, after four decades of extremely fast growth, which has certainly benefited the country, but which has also created significant environmental problems and social problems. China's moving to a new phase um, and has defined the goal of building a great modern socialist country that is prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious and beautiful by the centenary of the PRC's founding in 2049. This means achieving environmental sustainability, achieving a per capita GDP on a par with the advanced countries, but with common prosperity rather than polarization. It's, you know, it's an extremely inspiring vision and one that I think should give us confidence that Chinese socialism is moving from strength to strength and that we should support that vision, we should learn from it, and we should celebrate China's successes, which are the successes of socialism, they're the successes of our global movement. And to quote Deng again, as he commented to Julius Nyerere, I think in 1989, so long as socialism doesn't collapse in China, it will always hold its ground in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, and uh, thank you as well to uh, those who have sent questions into the Q&A. Um, 
again, if you have a question, uh, please submit it there and I will um, uh, pass them on to uh, Carlos. Um, we do have a couple already. Uh, the first one is, um, what do you think is the best response to the allegation that China is a uh, quote unquote authoritarian country? Um, well, I'll uh, turn that one over to Carlos and uh, look for some other questions to come in. Uh, thanks very much, Scott. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a kind of, it's a sort of reasonably well-known trope um, of China as, as authoritarian. Um, I mean, it's certainly having visited China a couple of times, it's not consistent with my experience of the country. And, and I don't think it's consistent with most Chinese people's experience of the country either. Um, it's, you know, China has its own democratic system and uh, you know, kind of made a quite controversial comment a couple of years ago um, that was picked up on by some of the Western media. But I said that China's much more meaningfully democratic than Western countries. And what I meant by that, is, well, primarily I meant that our countries, you know, Britain, the US, Europe, Australia and so on, are not actually democratic, you know, like that is the mainstream line that we live in a liberal democracies and liberal democracy is a universal and absolute truth and, and, and the gold standard of democracy. But actually, all of that is a cloak for the fact that we live under capitalist democracy, which is ultimately the rule of the capitalist class. Um, and our social norms and our economy and our lives are determined by capitalist production relations and by the supremacy of the capitalist class by the people who uh, who own capital and deploy capital. Um, China has a completely different social system, has a completely different political system. It's actually got a quite vibrant uh, political democracy, I would say, in terms of the National People's Congresses, in, in terms of the People's Consultative co Committees, people are very strongly encouraged to get involved at all levels of governance from the village upwards. And one major difference with the US, one major difference with Britain is that money has got nothing to do with that system. Actually, when I was in, um, when I was in Beijing in 2019, a friend commented to me in relation to a comparison of the democratic systems of China and the US, that, and this is while Donald Trump was president, she said, well, one thing about China money can't buy elections and money's got nothing to do with politics. You can't just spend a load of money and become president of the country. Someone like Donald Trump couldn't become pres you know, village prefect in China, never mind president of the country. If you look at the people in the Central Committee and the Politburo and the Standing Committee of the Politburo, these are people who've got decades long record of serving the people of, you know, for example, being governors of provenance, provinces of 100 million people each um, and making people act actively making people's lives better. Um, so there's a system of elections, there's a system of, um, of choosing candidates, which is very democratic and which is based, as I said, not on money, but on people's records of serving the people and serving the cause of Chinese socialism. Um, there's a very strong focus on making democratic rights available at all levels of society and constantly striving to increase participation. I mean, when I was there a couple of months ago, um, we were taken to like a demonstration village where they were for the, it was set up 10 years ago. And the idea was to experiment with new forms of governance. Um, so they've got, in addition to in this village of, I don't know, 10,000 people, they've got 10, uh, village employees, but they've also got teams of volunteers and party members who are encouraged to just get involved in fielding opinions, so harvesting people's opinions and complaints and suggestions, and also meeting their needs. So, and that was especially important during the pandemic, for example, in terms of uh, looking after people who are older people who don't live with family members, helping out people who've got um, health conditions, you know, maybe people need under lockdown, people needed driving to get dial dialysis and so on and so forth. And they've got thousands of these experiments in new forms of democracy and participation taking place throughout the country. 
they perform these experiments, they gather the results, and then the results feed into agreed processes. So that not only is that is China a more democratic society than ours, but they're constantly seeking to improve and perfect that democracy as time goes on. So the trope of, you know, communist authoritarianism really it really doesn't resonate. What you don't have is the 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 dictatorship of capital. And that's a tremendously liberating phenomenon. Thank you. Um, we have a, uh, another question. Um, uh, this one from uh, from Roberta. Do you have any insight into the um, uh, occasional tensions and the tense relations between Vietnam and China? Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm far from an expert in the subject, but uh, the two countries do have a very complicated relationship, which is the product of a very complicated history, um, which goes goes back well beyond um, the the Vietnamese Revolution of of 1945 and the Chinese Revolution of 1949. And um, you know, it goes back literally thousands of years um, to you know the Chinese dynasties and and you know, Vietnamese people's sort of fierce defense of their independence. Um, and then following a period of very close cooperation in the middle of the century, the, uh, the 20th century rather, um, at some point, uh, essentially as a result of the Sino-Soviet split, relations became quite hostile between them um, for a number of reasons. But more or less, Vietnam kind of came down on the on the Soviet side towards the end of the 1960s, um, at a time when uh, China, having defined the Soviet Union as a major threat and facing you know huge troop buildup on its northern border and so on, felt that you know having a Soviet aligned Vietnam was was a was a very serious threat then there were further complications in relation to Cambodia um so and from 1979 uh, where there was a short border war and throughout the 80s the countries were in a state of you know uh you know pretty serious hostility and from the early late 80s or early 90s relations have continued to improve they still have certain disputes regarding islands islands in the South China Sea or what the Vietnamese call the East Sea. Um, however, I would say that these days the relationship is very well managed. The tensions are very well managed. The two leaderships, the leaderships of the Vietnamese Communist Party, the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, you know, take a very mature and, and responsible view, and they understand all the dynamics of history and the present. Obviously, the it, the whole thing is complicated again by the fact that the United States recognizes these tensions and is trying to leverage them to triangulate in the region, as the US has always tried to do, uh, as it also did or, or attempted to do in relation to the Soviet Union and China at the time of the Sino-Soviet split. Um, so the U.S. is trying to cozy up to Vietnam. The U.S. is offering Vietnam more favorable trading terms um, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and uh, in an attempt to bring Vietnam into a kind of anti-China front, because that's the U.S.'s major geopolitical project at the moment, is a new Cold War, which is directed against the whole global south and against the whole idea of multipolarity, but primarily, you know, first and foremost, against China. So whatever allies the US can bring into its camp, the better from its point of view. I think it's very clear that the Vietnamese understand that extremely well. The Vietnamese do want to have good relations with the US. Um, uh, the US remains an important market for Vietnam. The US remains an important source of capital and investment for Vietnam. Um, but so does China, you know, uh, the China's Vietnam's number one trading partner. They obviously have a very strong ideological affinity that goes back to literally the 1920s to the to the birth of the Chinese Communist Party, to the birth of the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. Ho Chi Minh himself 
worked for for a long time with Mao Zedong, with Zhou Enlai, um, with Zhu Dei in China. Um, and China was a huge source of support for Vietnam during its liberation struggle, during um, the War of Independence against the French, and then during the War of Independence against uh, against the US but between 64 and 75. So there's a huge amount of history there. Um, I don't think anyone's going to make reckless decisions. I don't think that, that Vietnam's going to be pulled into any kind of military or political or diplomatic alliance against China. And I think it recognizes that at this point in history, there are two major trends in global politics. One is uh, the pursuit of hegemony. One is the pursuit of continued imperialism, essentially the project for a new American century. And the other is the multipolar project, which is, you know, which really has China as its key motive force. Vietnam understands that Vietnam, the, the Vietnamese leadership, know which side of history they're on and which, which side of history they want to be on. So I think relations are generally speaking going well, and I think they'll continue to go well. Thank you. Um, following up on that, we have a couple more questions about um, uh, sort of the, uh, China and, and foreign policy and, and uh, China in the foreign policy of the, the U.S. in a certain sense. Um, uh, one asks, uh, what are China's goals concerning nuclear power and energy and where are they in uh uh, in terms of nuclear weapons, are they supportive of nuclear disarmament? Um, and another uh, from Shelby asks, um, will China be forced to increase military spending um, in a way that will hamper uh, social development? Uh, Carlos, I can't hear you. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, great questions. Thank you very much for those. So on the nuclear question, uh, China is a nuclear power. As people know, China's got, I think, around 300 nuclear warheads compared to the US's 6,000 or so. China's been a nuclear power since 1964, and it's maintained since its first successful nuclear test in 1964, uh, no first use policy, uh, which is very important. So. That is a, a, a clearly stated policy that China will never use nuclear weapons in any context other than as self-defense. If it's the victim of a nuclear attack, then it reserves the right to use nuclear weapons against, uh, against the perpetrator. But in no other instance would it use nuclear weapons. And it has a policy of uh, a clearly stated policy that it will never use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states. So China does nu have nuclear weapons. I think, uh, frankly speaking, it's very important that it does. I think China's nuclear weapons, in a in a uh, strange and ironic sense, are a force for peace, um, much in the way as it was very important that the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. And if the Soviet Union hadn't had nuclear weapons, the Korean War, for example, would very likely have gone a different way. Truman and MacArthur would probably have annihilated the North of Korea, probably would have annihilated Manchuria, probably would have annihilated um, Vladivostok and uh, the eastern part of Siberia and would have used that you know, to, to kill millions in their pursuit of, of domination and hegemony. So China has nuclear weapons because it needs nuclear weapons. Um, it does have a policy on nuclear disarmament. And again, this parallels the, the policy of the Soviet Union throughout the Soviet Union's existence the, since the Soviet's first successful nuclear test, uh, which I think was in 47 or 48, um, the Soviets um, consistently called for multilateral nuclear disarmament. Um, they were they were always the leaders in, in that core. And the same is the case with China today. They China calls for nuclear disarmament at a global level. Of course, um, it can't be a type of dis nuclear disarmament where China disarms and the US doesn't, because then China renders itself vulnerable to nuclear bullying and nuclear threats. And China's not going to do that. And I think it's very sensible that it doesn't. Um, it maintains what it considers, considers to be um, a kind of minimum viable nuclear force enough to defend itself if it needs to defend itself and no more. And um, 
And I think that that links into its nuclear, its military strategy in general, and in terms of its military spending. You know, China's made a very detailed study of what happened in the Soviet Union, how the Soviet Union went from being the first socialist country, the biggest socialist country, the most advanced socialist country, to not existing. Um, and I, I don't think, I mean, I've, I've written a book on this subject, but, uh, and it's complicated, and, and the arms race isn't the only factor there, but it is a factor that ultimately, by the end, by the 1980s, the, US, uh, the USSR was spending an enormous proportion of its budget on, on its military, on the arms race, um, and, and, and on the war in Afghanistan, which essentially didn't go very well. Um, and China's not going to do that. You know, uh, China China's military budget is, I think, stands at about 2% of its GDP, um, so lower than the US is. And I, I, I very much doubt that it's going to go much beyond that. You know, China does need to mo modernize its military to some degree. It does need to be able to defend itself. It will do that, but it's not going to be get it's not going to get dragged into an arms race. Um, and just to quickly pick up on a related question, which I think was mentioned of nuclear energy. Um, yes, uh, nuclear energy is part of China's energy mix. It's actually China and Russia are the only countries that have really been investing quite heavily over the last two, three decades in nuclear energy. Um, it's a very controversial topic, topic and people have got different opinions on the question. Um, I personally think that that's like um that it's the right the right thing to do in the sense that if they were to if they were to get rid of nuclear energy if they were to take that out of their energy mix then that would almost certainly be replaced by um by fossil fuels as it as is happening now in germany as is happening in france um you know anti nuclear campaigning has led not to taking up renewable energy and rolling that out in a big way but to reverting to fossil fuels. Um, and you know, fossil fuels, uh, uh, average European heat wave kills literally thousands of people. Uh, now we've had some nuclear nuclear disasters. We've had 10 Mile Island, we've had, uh, sorry, Three Mile Island, we've had uh, Fukushima, we've had Chernobyl, um, but they haven't caused disaster on anything like the scale um, that we've seen with fossil fuels. And on that basis, I think, you know, that that continued investment and continuing to see nuclear energy as part of their their energy mix is important and useful. And of course, they're one of the leaders when it comes to to experimenting and innovating on nuclear fusion, which is potentially a very safe and limitless source of fuel for the uh, of energy for the future and which isn't associated with radioactivity where you know the the its waste is basically water vapor so yeah that that's where they stand more or less i think in relation to nuclear energy thank you um uh, and so uh it's a question from colton um, I live in middle America. I work, I'm a working class person. I see most of my relatives and coworkers consider China an enemy uh, because of what's uh, said about them by right wing propagandists. Um, and uh, specifically the, the, I think the idea that, uh, you know, um, Chinese, uh, China is stealing jobs from the, uh, from the US. Um, how do I open their minds uh, without them shutting down? Or how do we counter that? <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough question and maybe slightly beyond my pay grade. Um, you know, I think what people have to understand is that, um, you know, China China's not their enemy. Like, it's very easy to blame China and the ruling class will always try and find someone to blame for worsening economic situation, for a deterioration in the living standards of working class people, which is a continuing process, um, and which starts well before uh, the export of manufacturing jobs to China. Um, you know that 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 decline of of U.S. manufacturing has been has been there since the nineteen forties and nineteen fifties, um, and in that period jobs weren't going to China, jobs were going to automation, jobs were going to maybe other parts of the world. But, you know, like 
you've got a kind of similar process going on in China at the moment in that China's moving up the value chain. China's becoming a more advanced economy. So a lot of jobs that came to China in the in the 1990s, for example, in low-end manufacturing um, that required um, not particularly skilled labor, those jobs are moving to other countries now. Those jobs are moving to places like um, Bangladesh or places like Sri Lanka or places like, or, or, or including Vietnam. And China's moving up the value chain. Um, but it is actually doing that. And, and, and the US should have done that as well. What happened in the US is that it changed the whole nature of its economy from being an uh, industry based economy from being a manufacturing economy to being a financialized economy. So, so much of the US ruling class is involved in finance capital these days, it is involved in shifting money here and there, in investing, in gambling. You know, this is kind of the neoliberal way. The US has lost a productive base to its economy. The US could be uh, an industrial power. It still could have industrial jobs and it could have better industrial jobs than mining coal or than or than working steel you know uh, well, one one kind of obviously ridiculous example is that china having become a, the world leader in in renewable energy and having become the major producer of solar energy materials china could be providing those materials cheaply to the us which could have a thriving industry using them and and fitting them installing them etc but instead of doing that, basically, you know, for the sole reason that the U.S. wants to undercut China and that wants to, to prevent its rise, they uh, impose sanctions on Chinese um, photovoltaic, on Chinese solar materials. So the, the U.S. ruling class is actively harming the interests of the U.S. working class in order to wage its new Cold War, in order to wage hybrid warfare against the Chinese people. So, you know, yes, the I, I perfectly well appreciate that the US uh, working class is suffering terribly, um, as is experiencing a significant deterioration in its living conditions, as is the case, I have to say, in Britain. But the reason is not China. The reason is the actions over many, many decades of the US ruling class and, it, and capitalism and its entire neoliberal strategy. Thank you. Um, uh, we're getting close to the end here. We do have a, um, a few more questions. Um, uh, maybe a couple more on the economy since we're um, uh, we're talking about that. Uh, one from uh, Norman uh, asks, uh, I've read that uh, Chinese socialism has as its most important foundation, the fact that finance is in the public sector primarily, meaning the private sector cannot, in effect, use finance for its own expansion at the expense of the working class. Um, uh, will you comment on this? I, I think maybe what does this look like in practice and how is that different from uh, how things work in um, Western Europe and the United States or in capitalist countries? Um, and another question asking, are there worker controlled enterprises in China? Thank you. Um, yeah, so in relation to finance, I mean, I touched on this in the presentation to some degree, and you know, it's a, it's a really important point because finance in a modern economy is kind of what controls the economy. If you control what projects, what businesses have got access to capital, um, then you you can you can direct the whole economy. And finance in a capitalist economy is done on the basis of private ownership of the banks, private ownership of lending institutions, and so, um, and and they're responsible to their shareholders, and they can't but make decisions on the basis of what's likely to make money. So profit profitability is the only concern in Western finance. China's big four banks. Um, by far the largest banks in the country are owned by the state. They're publicly owned banks. So that means that the state is able to make investment decisions, is, is able to make those decisions around allocation of resources. If the state, if the National People's Congress, if the Communist Party um, decide that a particular thing is a priority, then 
they can ensure that the lending institutions provide capital um, to meet those needs, um, to to turn those priorities and to turn those projects into reality. Um, and, you know, I think renewable energy is a, is a very good example of that. You know, China has become the world leader in renewable energy precisely because it's invested billions and billions and billions of dollars into it you know and and we're we're beneficiaries of that or we could be beneficiaries of that because that investment has brought the cost of solar energy has brought the cost of wind energy down to a point where it's actually in a lot of places it's cheaper than it's than its equivalent fossil fuels it's it's that's creating a situation where it could be possible for many countries across the developing world in africa in the middle east in the pacific to actually leapfrog fossil fuel capitalism like to go from not having electricity in people's homes to having electricity in people's homes without having to go through a period of burning coal or burning oil or burning gas. So you know, that's been made possible by an investment strategy which is based on public ownership of the financial institutions, public ownership of the major banks. Um, you know, the same as the, you know, I gave the example in the presentation of of infrastructure. You can go to any city or in any area of Britain outside London, and the infrastructure is disastrous, and people can't live their lives because they can't travel. Um, you know, they can't do basic things. Um, whereas you can go to central China, you can go to the west of China, you can go to Qinghai, you can go to Tibet, you can go to Inner Mongolia, you can go to Xinjiang. I went to Xinjiang in 2019. We went to Urumqi, which is the capital city of Xinjiang, and they just very recently opened its first metro line. Um, uh, now, Xinjiang has, hasn't got a huge population. It is like very quite den uh, sparsely populated, certainly compared to the East Coast, but they've got this modern infrastructure. They've got a metro line, they've got airports, they've got high-speed rail going into and out of the cities, going into and out, uh, into and out of the towns. Um, they've got modern schools, they've got modern hospitals, they've got modern roads, they've got modern ports and so on, they've got bridges. Um, and you can compare that with the country, you know, other countries in the region in Central Asia or in Afghanistan with which they share a border, and there is no comparison. And again, it's that the government has decided, you know, the people have the people's representatives have decided that it's a priority that's really important that all other all areas of the country, not just Beijing, not just Shanghai, not just Tianjin, not just Guangzhou or Shenzhen, etc., um, have these things. You know, not just the equivalent of the the wealthy, the affluent, you know, like East Coast cities, or not just the equivalent of New York and Boston or whatever have these things, but the equivalent of. Appalachia, the equivalent of Virginia, the equivalent of Ohio or Indiana have these things, um, which is a very unique thing to, to China. And a big part of it is, is absolutely public control of finances. Um, sorry, there was a second country, which I've, since I've been yabbering on, forgotten about. Uh, 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 Worker-controlled en enterprises. Uh, do, are, do they exist in China? Are they something that China is experimenting with? Uh, yes, there are worker controlled enterprises in China. Um, like the how we think about worker controlled enterprises or um, you know the type of worker controlled enterprises that they had to some degree in in Yugoslavia, for example, it's not like a dominant form in the Chinese economy. I'm sure there'll be lots of experiments along those lines, but um, you know, the China's biggest economies and and accounting for around half of the Chinese economy are state-owned enterprises, which like in the very kind of basic sense of the word are worker-controlled enterprises. Um, so yeah, in, in that sense, sure, there are worker-controlled enterprises, um, but that's per perhaps in a in a slightly different sense to 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 the to the one that was was meant by the question, um, what is possibly interesting is that um, the state enter owned enterprises and private businesses above a certain size they have to have a communist party branch and we we visited a couple of private businesses um, 
uh, when I was on a delegation a couple of months ago in Guangzhou, um, including a, a biomedical business. And yeah, so it's a private business and it would have a couple of thousand employees, but it's very clear that it works in close cooperation with the Communist Party. The Communist Party has a very active branch there. I think the chair of the company is a, is a member of the Communist Party. Um, so the, the party's got a branch in this business. Um, the branch has to have representation on the business's management. The branch obviously co uh, coordinates very closely with the Trade Union Federation um, and is involved in, in the decision making. So in that sense, in China, even in private enterprises, workers have um, a lot more control than they do uh, than than their counterparts in the West do. And another example of that is that Walmart, which is, as you know much better than I do, a famously terrible employer. Um, China is the first country in the world where Walmart was forced to unionize if it if it wanted to open stores in China, um, and you know that was because of. China, you know, the, the location of political power in China in the hands of the working class and its allies, in the hands of the working people, and the control of the trade unions in China and the control of the Communist Party. Thank you very much. Uh, we've re reached the end uh, of our program here. I, I apologize to uh, those whose questions I, um, I could not get to. Um, uh, we will make the uh, recording of this uh, presentation available on the uh, Communist Party USA YouTube channel. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our guest, uh, Carlos, once again, um, and uh, our participants as well. And please uh, stay stay tuned, watch your texts, watch your emails, um, check out our Communist Party USA uh, Facebook page for announcements on upcoming um, installments of the Marxist classes. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again, and um, have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much.